So we'll continue with Psalm 139. We did the first 12 verses yesterday. I'm going to just read them. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So yesterday, we looked at these 12 verses and in short, they spoke of the omniscience and the omnipresence of God. That And David is of course uh, speaking of first God knowing him so intimately, completely, inside out as well as and and part of that knowing is also because god is always present he's david cannot go anywhere where god is not there and so that was the sense of the first part of the psalm and in one sense as we continue that's why i read it because the next verse verse three starts with four you created okay why why does god know david so intimately why is God even bothering to be everywhere? And we saw yesterday that even when, basically David was saying, even if I try to run away, wherever I try to run, you are there. You are guiding me, you are protecting me. And David's answer really is, is because God has created David. Okay. So this next section is verses 13 to 18. For you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Again, these are some very familiar, very popular verses in the Bible that people can quote. They are beautiful verses. They can also present problems. So verse 13, as I said, David goes on to the fact that God has um, created him so intimately in that sense. He says here, he says, for you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And the point being this, that God made David's innermost parts in his mother's womb itself. And therefore, God knows David so intimately. Because of that, God, right from there, you were so involved, intimately involved with me. And it's interesting because those words, of course, created and knit or, or wove me together. That word is knitting or weaving, that sense of weaving. And it actually comes a little later in the psalm. Okay. The word created can also mean possessed. It's not the same word that is used, for example, in, in Genesis chapter 1. It's another word that, that can mean created. And it makes sense in this context because he is talking about being created. But it also means to be possessed or to be owned. And that word knitted also means to be covered. And I thought that both those meanings really hold true. We are both formed and protected by God from our mother's womb. Okay. Then verse 14, David says, I praise you. That's that word for exuberant praise. David's acknowledgement does not just stop at realizing this reality. But it moves on to exuberant praise. 
that God, you have, this is what, this is your knowledge of me. This is how you've made me. And then he goes on to say these two words, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Okay? That word fear is the same word for reverence and awe and fear, of course, depending on the context. It's a word that is used for the fear of, of the Lord to revere him, to be in awe of him. And I have been fearfully made really means this, that man has been created to inspire awe. And of course that makes sense because we are made in God's image. And God is an awesome God. He is a God to be feared, to be revered. And then wonderfully made. That wonderful, that word wonderful is to be separate or distinct. To be distinguished. Okay, so man has been created, of course, distinct from the rest of creation. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So, so David is fully convinced of the wonder of God's creation, of that separateness, that distinctness of God's creation seen in him just as it is seen in all of God's works. Just think about what David is saying here. Understand this. I mean, we we have, I mean, David is a larger than life figure for us. He's uh, one of the main heroes of the Bible. For many people, he is the hero of the Bible, I guess, apart from Jesus Christ. And, uh, but recognize the fact that that he would have gone through a lot of the struggles that some of us go through because he was rejected. He was considered of no importance. We've said in the past, I mean, I've, I've taught this that almost certainly he was an illegitimate child and con considered of, considered nothing in that uh, family. And so it's, 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 there's no reason to assume that David has such a wonderful self-image. You see, it's most likely that despite that, he's able to say this to God because of his trust in God, because of his understanding of God's intimate knowledge of him and what that is saying to David about himself and about God's love for him and desire for him and relationship with him. Because uh, do I say to somebody who thinks they're ugly or somebody who's born deformed, for example, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. It's not for us to tell somebody else. This is a personal testimony. It is David saying it about himself. You know, there are things in the Bible that are expressions of that person's, that come from that person's experience of God and relationship with God. When it is used in the, when it is used doctrinally, it can be abusive. You know? This word, these words can only be spoken from your point of view when you come to realize. Yeah, and sometimes, and, and, and maybe a Nick Wojcik will say that now. You see, but we can, when he was younger, a Sunday school teacher couldn't tell him, no, but the Bible says this, you better believe it. No, it doesn't work that way. It's the other way. That's where David says it about himself. And it struck me that he also, was, I mean, we, we know now that he was very attractive and all of that, but he didn't feel that about himself growing up. And so it is for the person who is and often in a difficult situation and we know that the reason why people are born this way or things are not the way they should be is because of sin which man brought into the world, not God's perfect plan. But the testimony of uh, praising God, no matter what, comes from that person's experience, not as some doctrinal thing that is shoved down from outside. Okay. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. Okay, so he goes on with this poetic imagery to describe the formation of his body in the womb, calling it the secret place, the depths of the earth. Okay. And he actually, so the womb, no, secret place, depths of the earth, emphasizing, remember this whole, 
the overall theme of this psalm is not i am created wonderfully it is the omniscience and omnipresence of god remember these are outflows of that outworking of that and so he's still talking about the fact that emphasizing the hiddenness as he was being formed in the womb and therefore god's ability to know anyway just as the darkness is as light to you which we saw yesterday this this secret place and the depths of the earth which are his poetic description of the womb were not hidden from god as he was being formed and actually those words are interesting that word frame refers to solid bone and that word woven has that has that sense of fibers and we know now that tissues are that kind of weaving tissues are woven in the body and so whether it's from solid bones to delicate tissues god saw all of david's body being formed in the womb that is that that is what david is saying here your eyes saw my unformed body in fact he actually uses that word unformed right that word unformed means wrapped or rolled up or folded for example when elisha picked up elijah's mantle he folded it or he rolled it or wrapped it up yeah so david is saying your eyes saw my unformed body think about this god sees us while our bodies are still wrapped or folded or rolled up that's a wonderful description of the embryo or the fetus where all the parts of the body are as yet folded or wrapped up into in their undeveloped state and in the womb actually an unfolding happens of all that is packed in there right from that first uh, act of conception and he's saying that in that state of un- i mean david is not saying it from some scientific point of view obviously and yet the words he uses are so interesting that even in that folded state god sees our final form okay. remember this is at the level of knowledge the intimate knowledge that god has of everything including our final form when we when we were still folded up in our mother's womb he says not only that he says all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be that's not a very you know that word makes us think of predestination it's not that this is not predestination and doesn't violate free will what he's saying is that god knows what will happen on each day that he has appointed for my life and it's interesting before one of them came to be the sense of that is okay at one stretch okay all the days of my life that god has appointed for me he knows what will happen okay remember remember for knowledge is not predestination that's very important everybody gets confused okay however think just look at this he says before one of them came to be which means that god knows and not just because of cause effect not just because of what has previously occurred you see sometimes you can predict a day or a season because of the previous thing that has happened or a choice somebody has made god knows everything in advance in fact that word you know that word days is not there in the original hebrew so we are not even sure it refers to days it may be still referring to the parts of the body continuing from the previous verse either way the overall emphasis here is what is of intimate knowledge even when i was in my mother's womb even when i was completely hidden from everybody and everything god saw even when i was folded up and there was no form god knew even when not a single day of my life was lived god knew what i was going to do what was going to happen all the days of my life and as as i said yesterday for david and i and i like this the song that we sang today for david it is security it is a sense of refuge a sense of comfort that god knows him so well so intimately it's not something that he's afraid of 
and then verses 17 to 18 how precious to me are your thoughts o god or that if you look at your thing is how precious concerning me are your thoughts o god how vast is the sum of them were to count were i to count them they would outnumber the grains of sand when i awake i am still with you okay that word precious is actually objective in that sense god's thoughts concerning us are precious and so they are precious to david they are precious in themselves and they are precious to david and they are also vast they are beyond counting just imagine uh, i mean a- any mother or any father their thoughts concerning that their child and now think of god you know, so, Im- so he saying that we imagine all that god thinks of in caring for just one single human being how precious are those thoughts how vast are those thoughts and then he says that even when i wake up his point is this so even when david is asleep and is therefore unmindful of god and his thoughts and presence that right? he is not thinking all these profound thoughts when he's sleeping he is not a, in, in a sense aware of god god is still with him when he wakes up god was still there he was still present you know that is the expression of god's thoughts for him that god even when i was not aware when i was asleep you were still thinking about me you were still there for me so that theme is continuing of knowing and of being there omniscience and omnipresence and so this is the first outworking shall we say or overflow of david's uh, recognition or acknowledgement of the omniscience and omnipresence of god that if god knows all things and he is everywhere all the time or his presence is always with david then it was true of the womb both that intimate knowledge and his presence and therefore david can say about himself i am fearfully and wonderfully made <laughs> because that is your nature god and therefore i know that even if i go to sleep and i'm unaware when i wake i'm still with you you are still there your thoughts are still there those vast number of thoughts are still there concerning me they are still precious and then there's a sudden shift of mood which is hard to understand if only you would slay the wicked o god away from me you bloodthirsty men they speak of you with evil intent your adversaries uh, misuse your name do i not hate those who hate you o lord and abhor those who rise up against you i have nothing but hatred for them i count them my enemies it's very difficult to you know understand why david has suddenly switched into this mood i'll just read them i mean obviously there was some context to it and as he was praising god this thing intrudes on him and Uh, I'll just read what Barnes writes. It's as good a descrip- explanation as any, really. It is not easy to account for the sudden and remarkable transition or diversion of the train of thought from the main subject of the psalm, in which the psalmist gives vent to his feelings toward the wicked and prays that they may depart from him. Perhaps the explanation of it may be that as the psalmist was reflecting on the fact that God is everywhere present, that He searches the hearts of people. that he must know all their conduct he was suddenly struck with the idea of the condition of wicked people in the presence and under the eye of such a being god knows everything god is everywhere and yet there are wicked people around god deal with them that's basically it sense and we will see why it's a diversion because in the last two verses he comes back to the you could just remove these these verses and go fr- from 23 and 24 it would flow so nicely actually yeah but since david has said this let me just share a couple of things uh his description of the wicked they are bloodthirsty they speak malicious maliciously of god with evil intentions you see it's not just that they speak maliciously the intent is evil it reminds you of jesus saying uh, that that you not just you sin you cause others to sin the intention is evil 
they misuse his name and that is of course so true of religious leaders especially to misuse god's name okay they hate the lord they rise up against him those are the description of the wicked and what is david's attitude towards the wicked okay in the light of the fact that he is so committed to this awesome god okay he said they deserving of death but remember from god not from him it's always vengeance belongs to god he doesn't want to be around them he has have absolute hate absolute hatred for them because they hate god okay not not because of what they've done to him but because they hate god he loathes them for opposing the lord he counts them as his enemies because they are effectively because they are god's enemies okay so even in this rather uh, harsh and brutal account of things the focus really is you know the the emphasis is like what we see with jesus at the temple that zeal for your house consumes me he is zealous for god's name and therefore he is so against those who oppose god okay and so these are strong words but they indicate david's love for god as well as his desire not to compromise with those who hate him okay. away from me you bloodthirsty men he doesn't want to be around them because they hate god so much and and this is an example of david sharing what is on his heart we don't have to follow him we have a better example in jesus who, who said love your enemies and yet of course he was zealous for god's house and for god's name and as i said in verse 23 and 24 david goes back to the theme that he was developing throughout the psalm he says search me o god and know my heart test me and know my anxious thoughts see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting okay it's a prayer the prayer is what search me know me test me see something in me and lead me that is the prayer okay and this is interesting you see david has already said that searching is a characteristic of god he started with that in verse 1 lord you have searched me and you know me and now he says search me o god and know my heart okay now we ask god to do that very thing in him that god does you see that the thing that god anyway does he asked god to do it in him the point is he is submitting to that searching to that investigation to that examination which is why i say that all that god, all that david is saying is not doesn't make him get upset or worried or fearful of god but rather he welcomes it okay he says god you search me and you know me and he says god do that i'm submitting to that and we saw that that searching is not something superficial it's a deep examination and investigation of his heart he says god i'm opening my heart to you my innermost being and come and do your work of searching and then he goes further he says test me that word testing to be tried to be tested to be proved like a metal was proved okay and no my anxious thoughts he says not just my actions but my very thoughts especially my anxious anxious or my dis- disquieting thoughts whatever is troubling me which he shouldn't have he shouldn't have these thoughts if he truly believes all he has said about god god you are omniscient you are omnipresent it's so wonderful right from my mother's womb you've been you you've known me and taken care of me and yet he has these anxious and troubling thoughts and says god you deal with even that i'm surrendering i'm opening myself to you 
come and do your work come and do what you do you see a lot of the time this lack of surrender basically is telling god don't do what you want to do david says do what you do have your way you are the god who searches and knows come and search me come and know me he goes further and he says god you are the all seeing god right he says where where can i he has already said in the previous section i cannot go anywhere from your face your presence your face your sight he says god you see thoroughly into me in case you find anything offensive you see this is beyond his confession you know along the way he must have confessed god have done wrong things this and that he said but lord there may be something that i don't know you see into me if there's any offensive way in me and that word offensive is wicked or painful or grief causing hmm? he says god see if there's anything you know search me know me test me see if there's something in me that is causing you grief causing god grief hmm? that word also actually means idolatrous and so something that has taken god's place in david's heart he says see if there's anything here you've known me from the time that i was folded in my mother's womb there's not been a single moment or instance that you have not been present in my life go deep check me out and finally he prays to be led from the wrong path that leads to destruction which is what the wicked is all about which he is just what he has just spoken about and into god's path that leads to eternal life the ultimate result of all this incredible revelation of those 18 verses i'm not counting say 19 to 22 when he digresses a little bit but the ultimate result of all this incredible revelation of the 18 verses and all these incredible verses that we quote all the time is what is surrender is david saying god you're so awesome i'm just surrendering completely from my innermost being i'm saying come search me know me test me see if there's anything that is causing you grief and lead me in your ways in those everlasting ways we're going to end with this prayer i'll read this as a prayer search us oh god know our hearts test us and know our anxious thoughts see if there's any offensive way in us and lead us in the way everlasting in jesus name amen